Good morning. Good morning. Always love this music to get us started and our, get our minds and, re- and our hearts ready for worship. The opportunity we have to be here, to sing praises to our God and to learn, and glad you could all be here with us this morning. If you're joining in on YouTube, you're welcome as well, and we're glad that you could be, listen in. Uh, in the way of announcements, as we've uh, discussed with fall coming up, a lot of things going on. Uh, one of the first things I want to draw your attention to, though, is coming up this Friday is the blood drive. That's from 2 to 7 p.m. In the back of the bulletin is all the, uh, the information about that. But uh, for sure, if you, could, uh, if you need any assistance, you have any questions, you can call, call Jerry, and she would be able to fill in any gaps of what you know. Um, as you can see, it is suggested you make an appointment. If you decide to come in last minute or whatever, that's fine, but it's, it's helpful for you and your waiting and the staff if you can make an appointment. So uh, if you're able to do that and contribute that way, that would be great and uh, certainly appreciated. Uh, above that, you see a lot of the different things going on uh, coming up. Um, you also see uh, some of the regular things that are starting back up. Uh, for tonight is our youth group. We're going to meet at 6 o'clock. And uh, so if you're able to come to that, please come. We're going to do a lot of fun stuff. But we're also going to just have a discussion about some activities coming up, including the disaster relief auction that many have said that they could come to. Uh, we're going to have some details about that. There's also the... Um, uh, our fall, next month, looking ahead already, we're going to have a kind of a fun fall get-together. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that and maybe some other things uh, as Christmas and that come around. So if you can come, certainly we'd be glad to have you. Uh, also, if you let's go through this. Uh, so two things that have been on the calendar that are uh, starting back up, we haven't had in a while. Momco, what used to be Mops, that is starting up this week. And, uh, and that'll continue with the first and third Wednesdays of every month. And you can see all that, those details. If you have questions, uh, you can see Mackenzie, Amanda, or Rhonda. They will be able to help you. Um, so come if you're a mom or if you know moms uh, of any age, come and, and join in that. And we will have child care available. Uh, if you are able to help with child care, you know, that, that's one of the successes of this program is because we have wonderful people who are willing to watch the little ones. So moms can have that, that few moments um, with, with other moms. So if you're able to help with that, that would be delightful. The other thing uh, is men's group. That's another regular thing we started putting out on the calendar every first and third Saturday. That way, you always know uh, we were trying to work around schedules, and that's always difficult. But this way, if you know it's first and third Saturday, uh, you know when it's coming. So we be glad to have you join us at 8 a.m. Uh, Grandparents' Day is coming up on Saturday. I'm sorry, next Sunday after church. Uh, what that is is after church. Grandparents, grandchildren, go over to the Fellowship Hall. They'll have some food and some activities. Uh, you're all welcome. If you have questions, you can see Darlene McAuliffe. She's in the back, and she'll be happy to answer those and happy to see as many faces as you can uh, to come and, and share, share in that special time. Uh, the other thing, Story Hour in the Valley, that is going still, but we've changed the date. That is going to be first, no, second and fourth Monday, starting September 9th at 10 a.m., uh, it'll be the same time and all that, or same place, but uh, we're going to move that to Mondays. So certainly come and, and join in the story. Uh, and then women's Bible study. So we have men's, the kids, youth, women. So we're trying to capture all, all ages. So we are all, all groups. So women's Bible study starts next Monday and at 6.30. So see Pam if you have questions about that. And then, uh, yeah, I think... That's it for announcements, except for I did want to mention that disaster relief auction, once again, sign up is still out there. We're starting to see some names show up. This year, as opposed to previous years, we're only helping on Friday. Uh, we're only committed to helping on Friday, so everybody put all your, put every, all your effort on, on Friday. We have the youth that will be coming in the evening. We can still use a few adults, but we need the, the, the booth staffed in the morning, too, making steak sandwiches and everything. Saturday, we are not committing to help. However, if you still want to go and you want to jump into one of the booths there on a Saturday, you're welcome to go and do that as well. But Friday is the day that we're needing the most help and the commitment there. So if you could please sign up, uh, we'd be grateful for that. <laughs> I believe that's it for announcements. Like I said, a lot of stuff going on. There's uh, some other things will be coming up in the, in the woodwork here soon, and you'll be seeing that as well. But for now, let's <clears throat> turn our hearts over to our music and, and worshiping God. You turn to your brethren, hymnal, the blue hymnal, um, number 14, Come We That Love the Lord. So let's stand up and show our love for God this morning. Please stand.
you may be seated and children can go to Children's Church to glow. And I can just say, <clears throat> as my voice goes out, um, this Thursday, choir is starting practice. And everyone sounded so beautiful this morning singing that hymn. So I think everyone could come to choir on Thursday. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. You sound good this morning. <laughs> So as we prepare for our prayer time, are there any praises or requests that need to be added to the list that's in your bulletin? Mackenzie. Is this mic on here? Okay. So um, I've asked you all to pray for my brother-in-law, Cody, and I'm going to keep on asking because they're working. Um, he has surgery again Wednesday, um, and this time to remove five more lymph nodes in his stomach, stomach cavity. So they're going to open him up from his sternum down past his belly button. Wow, okay. And um, so pray that they can get all the cancer out. But also, he has until Wednesday to gain fat. And for those who don't know, he's a very small man. <laughs> and so they're worried um, because he has to go on a fat-free diet for a month, and then he has to start chemo. And he's like 120 pounds soaking wet, and he's like 5'8". So So he's supposed to gain fat on a fat-free diet? He has until Wednesday to, to, gain. to gain as much fat. And then he'll go on the fat-free diet after yes. that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. And then he'll, um, after this surgery, he has a couple rounds of chemo ahead of him. So right. okay. that's the biggest concern right now is um, sure. his weight. All right. We'll pray for that for sure. Thank you. So I just, thanks again, you guys. Like, How's Ariel What a blessing. Doing? That's why you're there. How's Ariel? Oh, she's all right. She had to wear um, a heart monitor for a month, and she just got that off. Um, and she's still waiting to see the cardiologist and a neurologist. So coming up this month, she'll see both of them. All right. Thank you. I, Thank sorry, you. I believe I pronounced that wrong. It's Ariel. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. All right. This is Judy Hartman. Uh, 63 years ago, I was a freshman at Elizabethtown College and wrote home to my parents that I met a dream boat in registration line. And this past Friday, that dream boat and I celebrated 60 years of marriage. And we're that's, very blessed. That's incredible. <laughs> 60 years for Jean and Judy, that's awesome. With that, let's, let's bow our heads in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, what a, what a great testimony and a great example and a great model. 60 years of marriage, the most important institution relationship-wise, other than our relationship with you, you've created. And there's certainly a model for others, including their own family. And uh, certainly in getting to know their family, we know they had a great and solid upbringing. And so thank you for Jean and Judy, for that inspiration, for that, for that gift that you've given them. And Lord, we just pray that, that this would be a special time for them, a special year, that they continue to appreciate each other and appreciate you. Lord, we, we lift up all marriages. We, we pray that uh, you would just be with each one. We know that some are, are, are well and some maybe not, and some are, are just, it's, it's one of those institutions that can go either way. And so, Lord, we just lift up each one. Lord, wherever things need to be worked on, Lord, let that, let that be and, and Wherever there's healing, let there be healing. And wherever there's joy and celebration, Lord, celebrate with them as you have established this as one of the most precious uh, relationships we could have. Again, uh, second only to your, our relationship with you. We thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for gathering us here as, as a big family, a big family of faith, where we could just be together and worship together and, and support one another, to lift each other up in prayer, knowing, Lord, that even when we leave here, in our own homes, in our own war rooms, whatever that looks like for us. We have the opportunity to pray for each other, to support each other that way. Lord, that we love each other as people of, of God. Doesn't mean we always agree, doesn't mean we always get along, but Lord, we are a family of faith. Um, all, all your children and brothers and sisters to the one who gave his life for us so that we may have eternity together and with you in heaven. So Lord, we thank you for that gift. May our time of worship reflect that appreciation just to be able to know that you are a God who loves us, 
you're here with us while you deal with all the stuff around the world that is not good that you need to deal with. You're also here with us. Uh, and by the power of your spirit, we know that you are with us 24-7. You never slumber. You never sleep. You never turn your back on us. And for that, we give you thanks and praise and, and honor. And, uh, and Lord, we just love you for that. Lord, we uh, lift up the names that are in this bulletin, as well as the others who may not have been mentioned. Lord, that you would minister to each one. Particularly, we think of uh, Mackenzie's family, her her brother and sister, and her brother-in-law and sister, as they deal with uh, their difficult things. We pray for Cody, Lord, with the surgery coming up, and Lord, more than just the surgery, the the uh, dietary restrictions and, and benchmarks he has to meet um, that are almost contradictory. That to, for each part, so he has to to gain that fat for the surgery and then lose it for the chemo. And uh, Lord, we know that that's possible, and we know that you can help him through that. But we know it's difficult, and so we pray that you do, and that you're with him. We pray for the surgery, that as they remove those lymph nodes, that the cancer can go with it. That this would be the time that you would just reach into his body and, and provide that healing that they've been waiting for. And Lord, that the chemo would just help to assure that. And um, through all of this, that you would be with them as they deal with not only the concern, but the discomfort, maybe the pain, the fears, um, for not only them, but their entire family. And that you just continue to bless Ariel as well as she recovers. And um, Lord, we just thank you for what you've done in their lives. We thank you for being a testimony in the way you work in all of our lives in different ways. We might not always be able to say that you've answered every single prayer that we've ever had exactly the way you wanted us to. But you have always done the right thing in your infinite wisdom. Sometimes that we don't understand. And that's why we are blessed to have that assurance of the peace that passes all understanding. Knowing that you are in control. And even if we don't understand, you do. And as we talk about today, regardless of what we go through in life, we have something amazing to look forward to. And so we just pray that you would help us, encourage, encourage us that way. Bless our time of worship. Bless our time in your word. And help us to leave here not only energized from worshiping you, but also um, with uh, more knowledge and more inspiration and more drive to do your work in this world. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.
you can turn in your blue hymnal to 517, we'll stand and sing, Open My Eyes That I May See. Please stand. You may be seated. So last week, if you're here, I quoted a song that we used to play for our girls, and uh, just thought we'd share the joy of that song with you. So. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Think about things that are above, not things that are on the earth. At the same monument that Christ Jesus had.
our girls had the joy, I don't know if they would consider it a joy, of hearing that quite often. They got to know that song, know that song quite well. And I know it's hard to hear some of the words behind all the computerized sounds. I did quote it last week, but just the idea of input, output like a computer. What goes in is what comes out, and that's true in a Christian walk. Um, how we project our joy and the faith of Christ is directly dependent upon how much time we spend with input, what we feed into our lives. And this is what we're working on today is uh, just the second part of our, kind of our prelude. Again, for those of you who weren't here last week, we had out for a while the QR code that you submitted your life verse. And uh, the idea is that we would start using these life verses during the worship service because they mean something to you. They can certainly be inspirational to the rest of us as well. And so I'm working on that schedule. That'll be out here in the next few days uh, as to when we'll be talking about it. I mean, it's hard to plan around everybody's schedule, but if you'll see when the verse that you submitted, if you submitted one, will be talked about. And uh, that way, if you're able to come here to hear that for sure, you can. And if not, certainly check, tune into YouTube. Uh, those will be on the website there. So that schedule will be out soon, and uh, we'll, we'll get into those here very soon. And understanding that schedule is still going to work around our Christmas and, and all that. So there might be a few Sundays where we talk about those verses and then Thanksgiving or Christmas. And then, you know, but that, that'll all be out here very soon. Um, for today, last week we talked about the input part of it. Today we're going to talk about output. And if you had your marker in your Bible from last week, we're actually going to pick up basically where we left off. Last week we were in 2 Timothy, and uh, we started at the last part of that chapter, now we're going to, of chapter 3, now we're going to chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 1 through 8. And uh, I'll read it, but as always, keep that open, we'll, we'll refer to it as we go through. Paul picks up in his letter, he's saying, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared, in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to, instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn aside they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may your blessing be added to your word. Lord, it is already complete the way it is, but it helps for us to be able to look at it and study it and, and determine what it is that you are trying to say. And so, Lord, as we do that this morning with this passage, as we continue to consider our need for not only spiritual input, but the way we then display our faith and, and, our, and our joy in you to others. Lord, help us to make this personal. Help us to be taught individually. Each of us may be uh, needing to hear something different from this passage, but may we all receive what you would want us to receive. Anoint my lips and as I speak and all of our hearts and minds to receive your message, that we may use it to bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So as you may know, maybe you don't, we recently welcomed Sharon Schemmel uh, as, to our staff. She began serving this week as our office manager in, the, in, our, in our office and uh, doing a great job so far. If you get a chance, stop in, call, give her one of your friendly welcomes that you're all so good at. I'm sure she would be glad to meet all of you. And a huge thanks to Cindy Pilgrim who has been doing so much to not only fill the office over the summer when we didn't have somebody, but also to train. Uh, she's doing an amazing job and uh, continues to. Um, but we uh, are so grateful for her as well. Unfortunately, as tends to happen in these times of transition, there are things that had to go a little bit by the wayside or be put on hold anyway. And one of those things is our website. Um, and so a lot of work has been done this week to try to bring that back up to speed. There's still some work to be done. Uh, Rondo is super helpful as well. And uh, actually, before too long, we're going to have other people who are going to be working at it. So it'll be flowing as it should soon. 
But one of these things that uh, I found very interesting is that the week that we decided to work on the website is the week that we're in the middle of this whole input-output discussion. And as we were working on that website, that was going through my brain all week. Because it's amazing how meticulous you have to be as far as what you're putting into the computer, where you're putting it, how you're putting it, the font, the pictures, how everything's to be placed. When you're trying to put the links together to make sure that when people click on a link on the website, it's actually going to the right place. That wasn't always happening. And so it's very important to give the attention needed for the input of that computer so that the output, what people actually see on the screen, is what you want it to be. And as we started talking about last week, this concept is no less important in our walk with Christ. See, being a Christian isn't just about doing those Christian-y type things, merely going through the motions, saying only to people who are safe, yeah, don't tell anybody, but I, I do believe in Jesus, coming to church once in a while, and saying an occasional prayer when everyone else is doing it. If our faith is superficial that way, and our, out, and our input as a result is minimal, our output will reflect that. And nobody will be able to tell us apart from that next person who claims no faith in God at all. The question you have to ask yourself is, do people see God in you? Is the output you're displaying showing, showing God or showing the light of Jesus Christ? And if the answer to that question is no, then the next thing you have to ask is, how big of a deal, to that is, you, how big of a deal is that to you? And how big of a priority is it for you to fix that? In the first verse of this chapter we just read from 2 Timothy, before Paul actually goes on to give the charge, or his charge to Timothy, he gives a statement explaining exactly why this should be a big deal. He says in verse 1, In the presence of God and Christ Jesus, it's the first thing we have to remember, we are always in his presence. Always. Psalm 139 says there's nowhere you can go that you're out of his presence. He's always there. In the presence of God and the Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead? And in view of his appearing and his kingdom. These factors in place, this is how Peter gives Timothy the charge. Understanding that we are in the presence of God. Understanding that we are in the presence of a God who judges the people. And understanding that that, that judgment or that last day is a lot closer than many of us like to think. This judgment of God on people, based on the all-important marker of whether or not people have committed their lives to Christ, is not just bluff talk. It's the real deal. It's actually going to happen. And so our acceptance or rejection of the call of God in our lives to provide the best output possible has eternal ramifications for other people. And this isn't just Paul talking either. The original call of, of God, the original call to do this work of shining the light of Christ and telling people about him came from Jesus himself. And that's how it all started, as, as testified by his disciple Peter in Acts 10, 42. Peter says, Jesus commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one who God appointed, and here it is again, as judge of the living and the dead, just like you heard in 2 Timothy 4. And you're going to hear a lot of connections like this this morning. This is, this is real stuff. People didn't just make these things up. It's all connected and it's all rooted in the words of Jesus himself. And so it's not just Paul talking to Timothy. It's not just me taking these words out of context. The reality is we all have an expectation to not merely internalize our faith, but in today's language to actually go ahead and, and wear it on our sleeves. Because the fact is, you never know who is watching us, whether to learn from us or to try to trip us up. And people notice whether or not we are presenting ourselves as real Christians or if we're just operating from a superficial faith. And so the responsibility, that's a big word today, the responsibility to maximize the quality of our godly output is for all of us. And it can be seen in how well we do in showcasing the joy we have as disciples and followers of Christ Jesus. And you're going to hear a lot about that here in a second, too. 
as Timothy was encouraged by Paul to do in this chapter, we take seriously and embrace the following aspects of our faith that encourage us and help us in this work. And number one, the first thing we embrace, oops, oh, we don't see me. We switch that to the slideshow. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Yep. Oops. We embrace the call. We embrace the call. It's no small deal that the work we do of projecting the output of our words and actions to showcase our amazing God to people, that that work is actually a call from God himself on our lives. It's not just something we do on our spare time because we have nothing better to do. It is a call from God on our lives. God is calling each one of us to do this work. And that's an honor when you think about it, that the great God of this universe has tapped you and me on the shoulder to serve him in this way. One of the founding principles of our church, the Church of the Brethren, is what's called the priesthood of all believers. It means that we are all called to be ministers to some degree and that we are all tasked with making sure the people around us know why we have the joy we have as Christians. For Timothy, his specific job was to preach the word. That was his, that was his job. And you see that in verse 2 of this text. But then for all of us, we can all have a part in the second part of that verse where we are called to be prepared Be prepared in season and out of season, that is to say at all times, to do the work of drawing people to the scriptures to learn about Christ Jesus. Peter says the exact same kind of thing, 1 Peter 3.15. But in your heart to revere Christ as Lord, always be prepared, there it is again, to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give a reason for the hope that is in you. And both Paul and Peter would also say, to add, to do this with gentleness and respect. That is, even when we are sharing the word with somebody, we're not smacking it over their heads and and yelling at them. Gentleness and respect. The idea that this calling belongs to all of us, the priesthood of all believers, also comes from the Apostle Peter, who learned directly from Christ himself. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Peter is directing this message to all Christians. Everyone who has been saved excuse me, by the chief cornerstone Christ Jesus upon, the rich, upon which the rest of us stones are carefully being laid and built into this house, this overall establishment called the church of which we are all a part. Cadors is one piece of a greater worldwide church with the same mission, found in verse 9 of that chapter in 1 Peter, where it says, you are a chosen people. Listen to the words that share how intentional God was about us. You are a chosen people. You You can internalize this, each one of you, individual. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, Together we're a holy nation. We are God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. To understand that a little better, we go way back to the Old Testament where it was seen as an honor to be chosen among the people to be called a priest. Those who devoted their lives to serving God and to serving other people. Even having the special special privilege once per year to enter the holiest place in the temple, the spot where nobody else could ever go, the place where the essence of the presence of God dwelt behind the curtain, the curtain that we know ripped apart at the crucifixion of Christ. Today, if you have been saved from death and darkness by the blood of Christ, you have been called into this work. To proclaim his praises, what I believe is a well-deserved thanks to God for all he's done for us. And to proclaim the same life-giving message to others so they also have a chance to take part in this marvelous gift. All believers can now do this because we now all have access to God. And therefore God is calling us to serve him and his people just like the priests of the Old Testament. Now, this is where people start getting a little 
squirmy about the idea of this whole reaching out thing. Understand, this does not mean that every single Christian is, to called, is called to become a priest or a pastor in the sense of you coming up here and preaching Sunday mornings or that you're necessarily supposed to stand on a street corner or go knocking on doors and, and banging the scriptures over people's heads. That's not what we're talking about here. I think this is why people get nervous. How we fulfill this calling of being a minister looks different for different people based on our gifts. And we've not talked much about gifts yet. We will. But basically those things that you know that you're good at or that you have a special skill at, sometimes unexplainable, that's a good place to start looking to see what kind of gifts you may have. How can you use those things to serve God? Like I said, I think we often get shy or resistant to messages like these that talk about evangelism and outreach because this is what we think we're supposed to do, this big, heavy-duty public preaching, and that's not the case at all. We are all called to different forms of ministry, maybe professionally. Maybe some of you are out there are, are aspiring pastors or missionaries or evangelists. But maybe your calling is on a volunteer basis to perhaps teach a Sunday school class. And if so, we still have openings. We still have a lot of children, Sunday school classes, and, and that that could be staffed from, from other people. Um, that would be a good opportunity to step up. Bible school class. Many of you helped with that. Maybe managing one of the departments on the elder body that oversees the ministry of this church. Maybe, maybe there's a call for you to do that. Perhaps you're called to volunteer at a district or denominational level, like God is maybe calling you to serve at the district conference or the annual conference level. Perhaps there's other jobs within this church you could do. There's, you can look at the bulletin now. Like I said, a lot of things are starting to go on. See where you can plug yourself in. Or perhaps it's not so much doing something in the church setting. But maybe you're called to be a mentor. We talked a little bit about that last week. Maybe you're called to mentor somebody you know. Shepherding someone one-on-one -on -one and helping them to learn more about Christ. To grow in their faith. To work through some difficult issues in their life. Preparing them for a life of faith and service to our God. Just this past week, I got to see the new movie out. It's called The Forge. Another one of the Kendrick Brother movies. The same people did Courageous and Fireproof and all that. That is a good movie if you're looking for some inspiration. And of the value of mentoring somebody. I, I recommend that one. Bottom line is there are all kinds of ways we can serve God in this way. But there are two things that are for certain. Number one, we are, all, we are all called to do something. Called to do something. And everything we do is, be, is to be done with our, all our heart and all for God. If you read my newsletter article this week, I quote, quoted from Colossians 3, 23 to 24, where Paul says, whatever you do, it doesn't matter if it's in the church or at work or whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. As you're working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you're serving. If you think of everything you do as a person, as, as a contributing to your family or doing your job or doing something in the church or volunteering, if you think of everything you do as serving Christ, maybe that gives us a different perspective. Don't look at this work of sharing the word of God as a burdensome, scary feat. It really isn't, most of the time. Look at it as serving the God who loves you enough to create you and then to give his life for you and for others, other people that he also longs to have in his kingdom just like you, but people who will not be able to come to his kingdom unless they know Jesus. And they don't come to know Jesus unless people like you and me show him to them. We are not pre-programmed with that knowledge. We use our output. And by the way, that output is inevitable. Even if you're sit there, sitting there thinking, well, I'm still not convinced. I really don't want to do this. People are watching you whether, you, whether you know it or not. Whether or not we're ready to say yes to God. The work is already happening in what people see in you. And so that's something we need to keep in mind at all times. That's why Paul and Peter both say to always be prepared. That's not an option, really. It's already happening. People are watching. They see you. So think about it. What, what adult or child in this church or in an organization you're involved in or, or some other way you know those people, what, what person can you maybe be a mentor for 
or do something to help them? What, what things in the church can you get involved in? Is it possible that you're starting to feel the call of God to seek a pastoral or missionary career? In what ways are you feeling the tug of God to use your gifts and talents to share the love of Christ with others? And really that's all this is about, sharing the love of Christ. And when we know everything he's done, that shouldn't be something that's that hard to do. But we have to be intentional about it. And of course, as we wrap up this point, we remember that what we share with others is not stuff that we just make up on the fly. Remember, we said that our output is directly dependent upon our input, which comes mostly from the scriptures that contains the truth of God. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to teach the scriptures, show people them. And so that's number two. The second thing Paul tells Timothy to embrace is the truth. The truth. We talk about this kind of quickly today because we spent time on it last week. Remember in the last chapter, chapter 3, Paul reassured Timothy that the scripture that he was about to go preach is in fact valid. It is, it is, uh, it is inspired and breathed out by God and therefore it is useful for the teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training that Paul is now encouraging Timothy to turn around and go share that with others. That stuff that comes into us, the input. The teaching, the rebuking, the correction, adjusting is then used to help other people. Paul's charge to Timothy was to preach the word, understanding that the word is valid, true, and given by God's inspiration. In the Old, in the Old Testament, which is all they had back then, and now today it's even more comforting to know that it is confirmed by the authority of Christ in the New Testament. And that's the key word here, the authority of Christ. Where did that authority come from? A couple weeks ago, we talked about Matthew 28. Jesus gave his great commission, and part of that great commission, he, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It came from God to Christ Jesus. And so now, because our output should be based on the word of Christ, we can speak it with his authority. And Paul would eventually tell Titus the same thing in chapter 2 and verse 15. These then, these then are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Whose authority? Not Titus's, not Paul's. The authority of Christ Jesus. But despite that authority, that's very clear, the debate continues still today about the validity of Scripture. And because of that, Paul's next set of words in this, in this letter are almost prophetic. We look at chapter 4 now in verse 3, and as I read this, I want you to think about what that looks like today. Think about some of the heavy-duty issues that our world is facing. Think about the way Scripture has been used to try to address those issues. And think about the way Scripture has been rejected. Think about that as you listen to this verse, verse 3. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside the myths. Written a long time ago and is very prophetic. We see it today. Someone once said that ours is a society that doesn't believe God's word or any word for that matter is powerful. You know the things people say. Talk is cheap. It's only semantics. Spare me your rhetoric. Are you preaching at me again? In our technological society, this person says, what matters is not words but actions, especially actions backed up by force. And what are the forces today that we think of? This person says force that is physical, economic, or political. I would add the word influential, especially as we near the 2024 presidential election. Many people are disgusted with what's going on. It doesn't matter what side you fall on. I don't go there, here. But just think, how are people feeling about the candidates? Why are they feeling about those candidates? If they don't think the candidates should be where they are, why did they get there? It's maybe about the power and the influence that they've had. What other influences have that kind of force and drive in our lives? Some of the ones they mentioned. How about economics? How much money am I making? And how do I get more? What about our image, our self-image, or the, what we project to other people? How do I look good to others? 
And what do I need to look, what do I need to do to look better? And then, of course, you have the earthly power. How can I get ahead? And what can I do with that authority when I get it? And how much of that stuff that we consume many of our days with, how much of that stuff distracts us from the truth of God's word? I'm not talking about my truth or your truth. We hear that today. Well, everybody has a truth. Nobody's truth is more important than the others. No, I'm talking about God's truth, the only one that matters. How do we get to the place where the love of God, the holiness of God, the awesomeness of God, the sacrifice of Christ, the promise of God leading us to the eternity of God, ends up with a lot more power than all these other influences in our lives and these other earthly forces that have seemed to take over. How do we get to that place where God is more important? No, in 2024, it is not popular to stand on the side of God's truth. And the repercussions of that can be the fuel behind some of our fear. I understand that. The question is, how do we overcome that? How do we heed the words of Paul when he had to deal with that? Earlier in this, chap- earlier in this book, chapter 2, verses 1 and 8, verse 8, where Paul said to Timothy, Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, or of me, his prisoner, Prisoner because people didn't accept that testimony. Paul says, rather join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. The most important power out there. How do we get to that place? I think the answer is in the last thing that we can embrace according to Paul. Number three, we embrace the outcome. What is the outcome of all of this? Whatever Good things or bad things or dangerous things happen because of our faith. What is the outcome? What can we look forward to? Well, here's what Paul says to Timothy in this section as he closes out this, our, our text for today, starting at verse 6. Paul says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. Interesting, and to me, I thought it was powerful to note that as Paul's writing this, He's writing among the last words he would ever write. He is pretty much concluding his connection with Timothy. Later in the letter, he encourages Timothy to come to him quickly. We don't know, at least I don't know, if he ever made it. Most scholars are are satisfied believing that, or, or things point to the fact that it would be later this year, the year that he wrote this letter, where Paul would lose his life. And he knew it was coming. He says, the time of my departure is near. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now what, Paul says. Verse 8, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, this isn't just about Paul, but to all, all of us who have longed for his appearing, All who believe in Christ can look forward to the same crown. And once again, you're going to hear a lot about the crown here. Because James would agree later on, the the book of James, as he says in the first chapter of his letter, verse 12, something very similar. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. All of those apostles, the original disciples of Jesus, James, the brother of Jesus, Paul, Timothy, Stephen, Titus, Silas, and many others, learned well to stand for Christ and his truth, no matter what they had to go through, showcasing that to others, whatever type of ministry they are called to, everyone was a little different. And they did well to model the charge of Paul in Romans 12.1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, To offer your bodies as a bodies as a living sacrifice. Doesn't mean that we're gonna die by doing this. It just means we are devoting our lives to him in his service. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. As we go back to today's text, 2 Timothy 4, you remember Paul talks a little bit about fighting a fight and finishing a race. It's the fight in the race he talked about in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, where he describes what those things look like. And as I read that, I want you to think about your life, maybe your, your fight that you're in or the race that you're running in your faith. 
What does that look like? For Paul, he says, verse 24, do you not know that in a race all runners run? It's pretty obvious. Anybody who's in a race, if you're in a race, you're going to run it. But in a race, he says, only one gets the prize. Now, we know that's not the case. More than one person is going to get to heaven. But his encouragement, as far as our zeal goes, run in such a way as, as if you're the only one going to get the prize. You give it your all. Verse 25, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. And here it is, the crown again. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. He says, no, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. That is to say, after he's gone through the difficulties, after he's done his job, for that thing, he keeps on going. He doesn't quit. He just keeps on going. And because of that, Paul could confidently say that he fought the good fight here in 2 Timothy. He says, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, and he did this knowing that he did everything he could to the best of his ability, fulfilled his calling, he served God well, and because of that, he was about to hear the words that we all dream to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. As I said, we are all charged with taking the word of God that has been and continues to be our source of input and praying to God, asking him to assign us a specific task in which we can use our gifts and his word to influence and inspire somebody else. And in doing that, the output that people see in us, which they will notice, like I said, whether we tend, intend for them to or not, that's why we're told to always be ready. That output will give them a cue as to whether or not they want to give this faith thing a try. And if you don't believe me that this is important, consider this. Every single person here has been inspired by the good that you saw another Christian do. They didn't know, they were, they didn't know you were watching them. Maybe they didn't want you to, but that was inevitable. You were inspired by the good some other Christian did. And everybody here has been rattled by unfortunate actions that some Christians have have done, things that they have caused you to ask questions and maybe even have doubts. And for some people, those questions and doubts lead them to a place where they forever reject faith in God. Should it be that way? No. But that doesn't mean that it isn't. And that we shouldn't be always mindful of the output we are displaying. And that can only be optimized when we're also making it our intention to ensure the right amount and the right type of input, constantly allowing our time with God to take precedence in our lives. As he is the keeper of the most important chunk of time we will ever live in, which is our eternity. Despite all the important things we're doing down here on earth, the most important chunk of time is yet to come. What is our focus? I realize one important thing that's probably going through everybody's mind Yes, Pastor Eric, that is a lot easier said than done. And so I'm going to leave you with this understanding. We all have trouble with these futuristic concepts. The ideas of keeping our eyes on that prize. The idea of eternity, the waiting the crown of righteousness. All these rewards that are somewhere way out there. We have trouble with futuristic thinking. We all do. I'm really bad at that, to be honest with you. I don't know if I told you this before. If I have, forgive me. In 2018, Ron and I went to Italy, and uh, we decided to save up for the trip completely in cash. We didn't want to use any credit. And so we had to plan way out in advance, well over a year, probably almost two years. And so we sat down, we budgeted out the trip, how much are we going to pay, divide that by the number of paychecks we had left. That's how much money we had to put each pay. And we put it in this bottle that had a really slim top. You could put the money in, but you couldn't get it out. And I needed that to make sure that I wasn't yanking the money out for something else that I needed because the idea of waiting two years to spend that money was ludicrous to me. That was hard to do. If a tighter paycheck meant that we had to sacrifice a date night or something else that we wanted to put that money back, that's what that meant. That was really hard to let go of that cash that I could use right now for something that was so far in the future. Believe me, I know how hard it is. But the feeling of smashing that bottle open just before our trip and seeing all the money we needed right there 
that made it all worth the while. Now, it's easy when you get to the point where you can celebrate the reward. It's hard when you have to wait for it. But that's just something that we have to discipline ourselves to do. Paul says, hang in there. Now, you may never face hardly any repercussions for standing for your faith and sharing it with others, but maybe you will. Maybe many people have faced all kinds of hardships anyway, so maybe if it helps to see it as having a, having a difficult time in life is inevitable. But it's worthwhile if our suffering is for the cause of God. And the outcome, we know, is going to be worthwhile. <clears throat> Atul Gawande, author of a book called Being Mortal, Medicine and What Matters in the End, shares these words that I want to close with. He says, in the end... People don't view their life as merely the average of all its moments, which, after all, is mostly nothing much plus some sleep. For human beings, life is meaningful because it is a story. A story has a sense of a whole, and its arc is determined by the significant moments, the ones where something happens. Measurements of people's minute-by-minute levels of pleasure and pain miss this fundamental aspect of human existence. A seemingly happy life may be empty. A seemingly difficult life may be devoted to a great cause. The bottom line is something else that is hard for us to fathom. We all have purposes larger than ourselves. That is another thing that's hard to do. It's hard to think outside ourselves and to see our life as a story that is not only for our benefit but for the benefit of others. And so when we go back through our life and we look at those significant moments, we have to ask, is our story one where we made an eternal difference in somebody else's life? Or is our story merely that, our story in which no one else was affected in a positive way by what we accomplished because we only lived for ourselves? Especially as we think in the realm of the eternal. I mean, we all get tired of seeing the selfishness that occurs around us, but then we have to ask ourselves, am I any better? Where are are the selfish moments in my life? Do I live for other people? Do I care about what happens to other people? Yes, everybody gets anxious about doing God's work. I get nervous every single Sunday, Sunday standing up here and preaching, and you guys are all safe. I think you're safe. The work of putting a message together and sometimes the stress and frustration when thoughts aren't flowing the way I want want them to. Outside of preaching, the making decisions or having opinions as a pastor, looking at the ministry of the church that sometimes are not as popular, they're sometimes met with a different opinion or something that people maybe not like. I know what it's like to struggle with doing the the work of God and I have it easy compared to martyrs and, and other people who are out in the public. I have it easy here. But the question is, are we only focused on what it feels like to do God's work? The fear part or the the inconvenient part. Are we only worried about the repercussions that might happen to us for advocating for God? Or are we worried about the repercussions that will happen to other people who never find God? It is a hard thing to step outside ourselves like that and to think futuristically. And I know that full well, but how can we bring ourselves to do that? To think of the rewarding outcome for many people who find Jesus and even for us who introduced him. We are all called to a different different type of work, glorifying God. And if you remain in prayer, God will disclose to you what that looks like for you. But first, you have to be willing to say, here I am, God. Send me. And then he will match you up with something that falls within your gifting. He will equip you. He will point you to one or ones, others, who he may have in store for you to build a relationship with. Like I said, maybe it's mentoring. Maybe it's Bible study. Maybe it's uh, a Bible study. Maybe it's teaching Sunday school. And maybe some of you are feeling the tug to become pastors or missionaries. Who knows? But let us as a church help you to figure that out, to help build and leave a legacy behind that will have eternal benefits to someone around you. Just talk to us. Remember, we do not do this work alone. We're not supposed to. We're never meant to, and so you don't have to. Call us. Let us help you. Let us be your cheerleader as you discover how your output would bring honor and glory to our amazing God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this charge. 
Thank you for giving us the ability to not only read the word and grow in our own faith, but also the responsibility to go out and help others. It is a scary concept, especially if we don't understand it. But Lord, you're not calling us to do anything beyond what we are able to do. You promise to equip us and gift us. Point us to that one person this week. One person that maybe could use an encouraging word or a smile or maybe even the start of a, a mentoring relationship. Whatever that is, Lord, speak to each one of us. Help us to know what it is that our input and our output can jive with what you have in store for us. That we can become solid Christians, even, even more solid than maybe what we already are. Continue to grow as growing and, and becoming solid is a lifelong process. Help us in this work. We thank you for all you do, for your patience with us as we learn and as we try to figure this, this stuff out. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look to our last hymn, Jesus is Calling, um, I'm going to share a quick story about it, and then we'll stand and sing. But if you notice at the very bottom, this was written by Fanny Crosby. And if you love hymns, you know the name Fanny Crosby. Um, she was known for writing over 8,000 hymns, um, very popular hymns that many of us know. But she was also blind. And when she was in her 60s, she was actually spending her life working with um, people on the street. She was in New York um, in missions. She was serving the homeless, the alcoholics, the, the youth that were lost, the children that were lost, even in her blind state. And one of the things that makes this song very unique that she wrote at that time when she was serving is that the telephone had just become a very popular new thing that people were used to. And you could imagine Fanny the excitement, being blind, knowing that she could now call and use this, and keeping that in mind when she wrote this song, and being out on the street, talking to these people, reaching out to people in missions, and having her heart be one that, I want you to know that Jesus is calling you and reaching out to you. And so keep that in mind, and the person who wrote the music for it did so years later when he came across her poem after he himself was called to Jesus, after being at a Dwight Moody, Dwight L. Moody um, evangelism, um, what do you, they call that, a crusade that he had heard. But just think about Fanny as you hear this and how she was doing this mission work with her whole heart. So please stand and sing, Jesus is Calling.
be with us now as we leave this place and as we go out into that mission field, the call the world, call to our back, back to our normal lives where we have contact with people all the time. Lord, may our hearts be open and our eyes be open to the, that person that uh, you want us to, to talk to, to reach. Lord, as long as we are connected to you, you are calling. And may we hear that call, whatever it may be, um, whether it's uh, an individual task or a closer walk with you or whatever it may be. May our hearts be open and our ears be open to receive and respond to your calling. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.